Okay. Well, this is IBI's 19th member conference. Sometimes held in partnership with other organizations, sometimes held on our own. After 10 years of conference partnerships, five with the National Business Group on Health and five with the National Business Coalition on Health, we're going forward with an IBI-hosted conference from this point on. <clears throat> 10 years ago, we had fewer than 200 corporate members at IBI. Today, we're pushing 950 corporate members. 850 of our members are employers, and half the Fortune 100 are IBI members. And I see Chairman Chris McSwain smiling over here, um, and we feel really good about that as well. And I think the time is so critical, as Bill outlined, for a new conversation about health and what it means. Now, in each annual forum, we have always presented a recent IBI research study on some aspect of health and productivity management. This past year, IBI published 15 original research reports and analyses, seven of which have been submitted for peer-reviewed publication, four of which have been published or uh, will be published this coming year thus far, and the other three remain in that review process. So rather than focus on a single study from this body of work, <clears throat> I thought it might be a good time to step back and ask, what does the research evidence tell us about health and productivity management, and where is it going from here? What's on the horizon on this topic? And we'll follow that with a distinguished panel to discuss these same issues. Employers, in my mind, have spent the last year, certainly much of their efforts, focused on tactical responses to the ACA, particularly around health care coverage and financing. As they go forward, the focus necessarily will expand to strategy around workforce health and what it means to their business. And those strategies undoubtedly will include discussions of workplace wellness programs, as well as the creation of healthy workplaces. Now, these changes will occur, I think, for several key reasons. First of all, <clears throat> CFOs are now asking the question about the value of investing in health and not just the cost of health care. Secondly, it is amply demonstrated that managing claims in separate silos is no way to manage the health of your workforce. And finally, I think employers are recognizing that discussions about health care financing are not the same as discussions about managing the health of a workforce. And as employers go through this transition, they always remind us at IBI that they have limited data, limited time, and limited dollars to make this transition. And that's where their partners will be so critical. Now let me spend a few minutes talking about how the approach to managing health has evolved for employers. Now it seems to me that it's gone something like this. Treat health care as a cost of doing business. Change plan designs to try to control health care costs from the employer's perspective. Narrow the focus to managing high cost claims for chronic conditions. Try to get in front of the costs of health by managing health risks. Recognize the limitation of a medical cost only focus and include broader outcomes and then try to figure out what's next. So let's explore this progression for a few minutes before we have our conversation with our panelists that helps set the framework for that conversation about what's next. <clears throat> you know, it wasn't really all that long ago that providing health care was simply a cost of doing business for employers. As health care costs grew, the value and perhaps the rationale for providing health coverage tended to focus on attraction and retention of key employees. And as long as costs were not significant, and I'll put <clears throat> significant in quotes, a significant part of operating expense, it pretty much stayed that way. 
And I think a great example of this is the case study that we did with MGM Mirage several years ago. And as, the long, as long as their trend in revenue growth outpaced their trend in healthcare cost spending, the economic issue of healthcare was a non-starter at that company. But as soon as those two trend lines flipped, healthcare became a crisis almost overnight. And I think that's what we see in a lot of employers, that healthcare all of a sudden and the cost growth has made it a crisis proposition. So as medical cost growth <clears throat> becomes untenable, employers turn to plan design changes as a way to ameliorate their cost burden of health. And we're all familiar with these, indemnity plans to PPO to HMO plans, the emergence of high deductible plans, a variety of value-based designs, changing co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance, tiered networks, narrow networks, the list goes on and on. So as medical cost growth becomes untenable, <clears throat> employers often turn to plan design changes, as we just saw. Now, the result of these strategies often has been to shift costs to employees. But as long as the shift stayed within reason, employers still felt that as long as the attraction and retention goal was not affected, they really didn't have any major reason to change. Now, as employers and their partners started to look at claims data, they recognized that a relatively small number of claims was driving an inordinate share of costs, the so-called Pareto group of claimants. So what did employers do? They turned to disease management programs <clears throat> as a way to get control of costs of high-cost chronic conditions. And disease management, for the most part, has been effective in achieving that goal, even as employers and their partners have been challenged to do good and sound return on investment analyses. Many of you are familiar with the recent RAND study on these issues. But the limitation of this approach, of course, was the very nature of disease management. It tended to focus on a small number of people with serious chronic health conditions. So the strategy essentially managed costs on the back end and did little for the remaining employees who were either low-cost claimants or were healthy or were not covered by health benefits at all. That is, the traditional approach to disease management ignored the health of a large proportion of employees driving performance for the company. Thus, the disease management strategy was insufficient to manage health of the entire population of employees, regardless of their benefit status. The logical question for employers, therefore, became, how can we get on the front end of the health care cost issue that we face? Led by several leading researchers, including one of our panelists today, Dr. Wayne Burton, and I know Dee Eddington is in the audience as well. Dee was one of the principal researchers driving this new conversation about health. Employers began to look carefully at how health risks impacted costs and affected the development of serious health conditions. The population health management perspective began to emerge. Many employers have been late to adopt this approach, <clears throat> particularly those without full-time, long-tenured employees. And amidst this broadening of focus by employers, there have been complicating factors in the employer setting. The changing nature of work in many organizations, along with an increase in the proportion of part-time workers and unbenefited workers, particularly in the construction and the retail sectors. One of the gestalts in the development of population health has been the recognition that it is hard to save medical dollars by spending medical dollars. And certainly wellness programs are under tremendous scrutiny today on that issue. So inevitably the question was, what are all the outcomes of better health beyond 
health care costs. And this took us right into lost time, health-related performance or presenteeism, and lost productivity. So this is what, what we might call the full model of health and what it looks like today. It encompasses leading indicators of health on the left side of the equation, indicators of medical care delivery in the middle, and lagging or outcomes indicators on the right. Now the question I think we want to address today is, it's a nice conceptual model, but what does the research evidence actually tell us about the empirical reality and validity of seeing the world in this way? Now if you've ever had the occasion to search on the term health and productivity or related topics in a research search engine like PubMed, you'll find literally a thousands of scholarly articles about these topics. In fact, for this presentation, Dr. Brian Gifford, my uh, senior research, uh, researcher, reviewed 156 peer-reviewed studies that have been published since 1990, each of which have been cited at least 100 times in the peer-reviewed literature, and together have been cited more than 38,000 times. Be happy to share that research listing with anyone in the audience that is interested. One of the primary purposes of the IBI Knowledge Bank on our new website is to bring together the peer-reviewed literature for our members. So attempting to summarize all of this research in a short presentation is clearly a fool's errand today. So perhaps a better question to address is what themes are supported by all that research in the peer-reviewed literature? And what does it tell us about the conversation that not only supports the academic research discussion, but now supports the business discussion about health and what it means to American companies? And as we see it, there are really four key themes that the literature really supports very strongly with empirical evidence. First, health risks impact medical costs, absence, and performance or presenteeism. Second, particular chronic health conditions such as depression, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, back pain, and a variety of others increase the total cost of health, but often are undertreated or not treated at all the classic example of taking only a claims perspective of health. Third, the employers bear the burden of wage replacement payments and the opportunity costs from lost work time. We conceive and conceptualize that as financial lost productivity. Employers always bear the financial burden of lost work time, regardless of how they finance health. And lastly, health interventions, including work size based programs, can reduce medical costs, absence, and performance, particularly over the longer term. So now that we've highlighted what this body of research tells us, we could kind of end the discussion right there and say, aren't we good researchers because we've established this model empirically? But I think it's equally important to ask ourselves, what doesn't the empirical literature tell us that's important to employers? Now, research to date tells us a great deal about all the costs associated with health and about their antecedents. Even the way research tends to address lost productivity is cost-based. The opportunity costs of lost time from work, a cost-based focus a cost-based looking at lost productivity. But thus far, the research tells us little about the impact on top-line business performance for employers, how healthier employees may impact business results. Now, there's no doubt that CFOs care a great deal about how costs impact the bottom line. There also is no doubt that they are intensely interested in strategies to grow top-line revenue. And as soon as we get into this conversation, we must expand our model 
beyond the traditional HPM relationships that we show here in the blue boxes. So the question in my mind ultimately needs to be, how does a broader set of factors together with the model that we are now so familiar with drive the discussion of population health and business performance? Such factors likely include health behaviors and engagement, business performance uh, that influ is influenced by population health, as well as corporate culture and structure, well-being, and a variety of things that the employer can influence, but does not fall in the traditional conversation about health and benefits. This takes us an important step closer to a health and human capital model of business performance. And I submit to you that that's the next step in this conversation with employers. And it's absolutely critical that people managing benefits, as Bill talked about, understand what business they're in and how it's measured. Because sooner rather than later, you all will be called to connect what you do to the success of your companies. And if you don't know the key business metrics that drive your company, you will be unable to have an intelligent conversation about the value of what you do. You will be stuck in that unenviable position of only talking about cost. Now, within this broader framework, <clears throat> IBI researchers have a diverse set of research topics and projects for 2014. IBI studies will include the longitudinal impacts of health risk change on costs, lost time, and performance, so we can actually see what happens to people and their outcomes as their health changes over time. So much of the work in this area takes a single year of data and looks across employees and doesn't follow employees over time. Within this framework, we'll also examine the impact of medication adherence and the impact of closing gaps in care. We're now undertaking research to improve the measurement of performance as it impacts business. And for any employer in the audience that is interested in that research and would like to be part of that research study, you can see Dr. Kimberly Jeanette, IBI's research director, and she can give you more information. And it won't cost you a dime. We will address the broader issues as well this coming year with a particular focus on hard to reach and difficult to engage employees. Initially through case studies and webinars with employers that are pushing the envelope on these issues as a precursor to more extensive IBI research. There is much to learn from the employer experience to crystallize these new areas. So when we rebuilt our website, and when Alex Dolan joined us almost two years ago, we stepped back and said, what is it that we can deliver to our members of value. Well, of course, as researchers, we immediately think about empirical evidence, good analysis, good data. But we recognize that equally as important is the stories that employers have about the creative and new things that they're doing. And in fact, oftentimes, I think it's the employer stories that have a bigger impact in the marketplace than perhaps good research, which as researchers drives us crazy, but I think it's a reality. So you'll see as we go forward a greater emphasis on finding and working with those leading employers that are on the cutting edge, that are willing to tell their story to other employers that helps us understand these relationships as we go forward. We're also working with employers to undertake studies on leave patterns and call centers. Bill talked about issues in call centers. We're going to be looking at that this year. Uh, we'll be uh, looking at the link between risk and benefits. You know, when I started IBI with Bill Molman, it was all about occupational and non-occupational lost time, and it kind of went away. And now I'm hearing more and more discussions about how does workers' comp fit into disability. There was an interesting article in JOM published a month ago about zero-cost workers' comp claims and what happens in the group health arena for those claimants. So that discussion of how this comes together, I think, is re-emerging as a key topic. 
We're also working with a group of employers to help them find new strategies to collect, report, and use population health metrics. So look for that coming up this next year as well. And finally, we have recently set up a 501c3 unit within IBI, the Center for Workforce Health and Performance, to access broader research funding both from governments and foundation grants. You know, the, the field of health and productivity has come a long way since we started IBI nearly 19 years ago. And there's still a long way to go. There is no doubt that the people in this room will be key actors in what happens next. The companies here can, by working together in this arena, change the face of what health means to our employees, our employers, and their businesses. We at IBI plan to be a part of that future as well. Thank you very much. So now we'll have a conversation with our panelists, if our panelists would join us. And as they come up, I'll introduce them. It's my pleasure. One of the, the really great things when you're around so long as I've been around, you just get to know and meet a lot of great people. And these three gentlemen uh, I've known for quite some time, and they will bring you a, a very interesting perspective. Dr. Wayne Burton, and Wayne is Chief Medical Officer in American Express, and I've watched Wayne's research work for years. Tom Carter, who is VP of Sales and Broker Relations at Kaiser Permanente. Tom gets the award for the shortest distance travel. And Dr. Mike Taylor, VP National and Medical Leader of Truven Health, and Mike spent a number of years as Medical Director at Caterpillar. So gentlemen, sit down, and I'm going to kind of come over and join you and ask hopefully provocative question. So Wayne, let's start with you as the employer. Um, when you went to Amex, you had a long resume of published research on health and productivity. How important was that work in taking the Amex job, that is Amex reaching out to you as their medical director, and what evidence did you use to make the business case for health investment and improvement and to build an integrated data warehouse? Well, thanks very much, Tom. It's an honor to be here and, and your leadership and Bill's leadership over the 19 years, I guess now, has been very important to this field. Um, so all great questions. The uh, first, uh, why did Amex approach me? And the reason was that my leader, uh, uh, boss at Amex, I've known for about 20 years, and he knew our research. Uh, David Kashosh, and many of you probably know him from Benefits. And so he asked me to, if I'd come to Amex to sort of reproduce the kind of things that we had done in our career. So uh, he'd known it, knew about it. We uh, met with the EVP of Human Resources, and I brought along a book of publications, most of which were with Dee Eddington, I know Dee is here, uh, that we've done over the years on health and productivity, and showed him that, uh, showed him the roadmap. Uh, a lot of it, Amex is a, a call center environment for a large number of employees, and uh, Bill Strand talked about that. We had a lot of experience in that regard. So Amex is a data-driven organization, and that's my background, so it was a, a great match. So Tom, let me turn to you. <clears throat> So Kaiser works with hundreds, if not thousands, of employers. And for any of you who have heard the Kaiser advertising, it's all about health and wellness. So how does a health plan get beyond the healthcare silo in helping clients understand the full costs and the value of improving health? So when you're not on the hook for the other costs associated with health, how do you engage your clients and how do the brokers and consultants play into that process? Uh, well, Tom, the, after you get past the first three rules of engaging with customers, the rule of price, price, and price, <laughs> um, the third one is around really understanding what, what's been really driving the impact on their business performance. So it, to me, it's been, especially over the last four or five years, it's been 
how are we reframing the conversation not to avoid the cost problem and the price problem, which we're all uh, struggling with, but really to more understand what the drivers have been and what the role of the employer in sponsoring sort of a, um, be an advocate for an employee's health at the workplace and to think differently about not just the benefits discussion, but more about how are you managing your total health risk at the workplace. And um, just because I, I like working in three things at a time, because that's just about what I can remember nowadays, um, I call it the rule of 70s. It used to be, I think, the rule of 50s. Now it's up to the rule of 70s. And it's um, one is about 70% of the health care costs are driven by chronic conditions. Over 70% of the chronic conditions are caused by you know, lifestyle or poor health-related issues there, behavior issues. And then in California, since I've been over the, our injury care network, um, I've learned to, to appreciate the workers' comp healthcare-related costs. And over 70% in California of the workers' comp total cost is associated with medical care. And so when you start to uncover these kinds of drivers with customers, all of a sudden it, it does change the conversation to really be able to describe, you know, what are your drivers, what can we do to help you think that through, and then the role of the broker and the advisor out there is for them to educate themselves about how they're participating in that, in that discussion as well to help the customer along. So talk a little bit about that process with ad advisors, either brokers or consultants. Are you finding that it's a conversation they are eager to have because they recognize that things are changing and it's going to be about value, or is it a struggle uh, in, in helping them understand these broader issues and the importance of health and the business and the like? Um, I, I would, again, say over the last five to six years, I've had two kind of uh, responses from that advisor group. One is, isn't that your job as a carrier? Don't you manage health and, you know, and, and control costs? And shouldn't you be you know, keeping that conversation uh, between you and your providers? And then the other is um, really the, the advisors that understand that with uh, with value comes advice that they need to give the employer. And if all you're doing is really shopping rates and benefits, and especially with healthcare reform, you can buy healthcare now in a lot of different marketplaces in a lot of different settings. And the role of the broker, if they're not offering any business value associated with how do you partner with a healthcare provider that keeps your workforce healthy? How do you bring best of class or best evidence around what some policies and environmental changes need to look like at the workplace? If, if you're not offering that kind of advice, I, as an employer, would question what, what value are you offering me because I can buy insurance a lot of different ways now. Uh, and Mike, you have a unique uh, resume uh, working at Caterpillar for so long. Mike uh, was on our board of directors when he represented Caterpillar, and I know that when you went to the other side that you missed uh, the board, Mike. But um, that experience in Caterpillar, of course, was really an important one formulating the way you think about this. But now that you're at Truven, you know, we all agree that integrating data makes a whole lot of sense. It allows you to look at person-centric issues, longitudinal issues, cross-program issues. Um, so far, this has been the purview of large employers with significant resources. So how can integrated data be made available in a cost-effective way to middle market and smaller employers? And then secondly, once an employer has integrated their data, what kinds of things are they asking about? What do they want to know that they've integrated their data? Well, let's, take, excuse me, let's take the second one first. Um, I think some of the more common things that, that we're seeing our, our clients ask is, is um, how do we use that information to better predict who's going to be gone in the future, who's going to be absent in the future is one thing, um, or what our cost drivers might be in a year or two in advance to see what we can do um, to, to circumvent some of that. I think probably um, one of the more important things is figuring out what can they what can they do, what parts of the data are out there that they can actually use to help improve the productivity of the workforce, and they're starting to get to that. Um, the company where I, in which I work now historically has been a claims group, and I have historically dealt on the clinical side with with HRA data and biometric data putting those together to build risk panels and then using those risk levels to figure out where, where to intervene. I agree with your earlier comment about disease management programs being, in a, I think, largely ineffective, right? I guess I don't agree with you. I, I think they're largely ineffective because of the way that they've been structured. And so um, where integrated data can take you is really to figure out what's, where's that sliver where there's actually something you can do from a modified perspective to actually improve the health of these people. 
And it's really about targeting and segmenting and really using the right pieces of data throughout it. And it's not just claims. But so we talk about claims in pharmacy. Um, I, I encourage our clients to get HRA and biometrics, uh, short-term disability, absence data. Um, all of those together, because it gives you insights you can't just otherwise get to. So I'm a, a mid-market employer, and I want to integrate my data. What do you recommend? Because I, I, my first reaction is, I, I don't have the financial resources to spend all this money integrating data. What are some strategies for the mid-market, and even smaller employers, around integrating data, taking the population health view, and making better decisions? One of the things that, that I've seen happen in a number of markets is smaller and mid-sized employers actually getting together and banding together in communities to try to more effectively measure and improve care. And Tom, you and I were in uh, Arkansas a couple of years ago, and I still have a relationship with that group down there because of how impressed we were with what they did. But there's a group in Arkansas that, that basically contracted with physicians to have they, a physician group specifically only take care of their employee patients. And they had to have an, uh, uh, they had to use evidence-based protocols, they had an EMR, and they had to measure their outcomes. And so they had their data sets put together in a way, and they were able to demonstrate that they improved the quality of care that was being delivered, the outcomes were better, and the cost was better. And that is one of the really nice examples, I think, of a group of small employers that singly would have never been able to do that. But gathering together, they could integrate the data through their health not, not their health plan, but through their health provider and have them become the manager of that data and run it that way. It is very effective. And in fact, there are several employer health care coalitions that are doing that very, that very thing. We are, and it's interesting. Um, I'm working with one now in the Southwest that is very interested in understanding what's going on in the hospital market. And we haven't talked about that today very much. But one of the things that I think needs to come into the equation is the physician side and what's going on in the hospital side. Um, I've been a... I graduated from medical school in 1980, so I've been in this business a long time, and I've never seen so much change at such a pace that we're seeing right now. And, and the encouraging thing from the hospital perspective and, the, and the, uh, the medical group's perspective is that for the first time, they're really under, I, I shouldn't say for the first time, I, I think really starting to get the importance of quality of care being delivered. And I think as employers, particularly large employers and leading cutting edge people like we are in the room here, I, th I think that there are opportunities to work with health plans and work with hospitals in your systems to actually improve care in a way that you can't do when you're just doing it by yourself. I'm a full believer in the health and productivity management approach. I think that makes good sense. But let's get the doctors and let's get the hospitals back into the business. And most importantly, <clears throat> let's align the incentive so that, that the employee, the employer and the hospital all wins when high quality care is delivered. Right now, the incentives are not totally aligned. And as we move away from fee for service and move into a value system where we're paying for value, a lot of those just melt away. And that's what, that's what we're seeing happening in leading hospital healthcare systems. And I think that's where employers can really play a good role because hospitals are looking for partners. Good. Now, we published oh, a year and a half ago a, case, a series of case studies, and uh, Amex is one of them. <clears throat> And in that process, Wayne, you talked about going beyond health and productivity to essentially the top line, linking health risks to customer service scores. How did you get there? And what would you tell other employers that want to start to look at the top line aspects of a healthier workforce? Uh, Tom, great question. And you know, one of the things I, I mentioned when I talked to our folks is an uh, interview with Wayne Gretzky, the great a uh, hockey player. And someone said, why are you such a great hockey player? And he says, you know, the other players go to where the puck is. I go to where the puck is going to be. And the importance of that, in, a, in companies like American Express, what are we known for? We're known for customer service uh, around the world and global, globally. And so, one of the things when I came to Amex, we reproduced the kind of data that we published for a number of years. And you probably have seen from my bio that um, basically all areas of health are under us. So silos and getting data was not an issue. And in fact, since uh, mid last year, I also had benefits for Amex too, until we find a new head of benefits. Anyone interested, come <laughs> see me. But one of the things to link to our business is how do you link health to 
customer service. And I was over in uh, India, and we have several thousand employees in a call center over there, and I was talking about data, and uh, they're very interested in it. And they said, why can't we link health data, health risk appraisal data, and productivity data to customer service? I said, let's go for it. And obviously with third party and confidentiality and all the other things. And so we first linked it over there and found that, no surprise, customer service, better customer service, actually better customer satisfaction, and I hope all of you are customers of American Express out there, if you're not, see me afterwards, <laughs> is linked to employees' health. Uh, those same risk factors that we've talked about and that Tom, you, you've done research and others have done research, Mike and, and others, uh, are linked to customer service. And customer service is measured by uh, those at the end of a call, you're asked or a random sample of customers are asked to rate the customer service on an IVR kind of system. And you're all, we're all familiar with that. Well, we can link that. Well, the, the value of it is to the businesses is they're saying, you know, not only is it important to provide uh, health and uh, our wellness programs and so forth, but it impacts our business. And the, if we can increase the employee's health, then it's going to impact our business. And American Express now has been rated number uh, one in customer service for, for uh, credit cards for seven years in a row. And we want to keep that string going. Thank you. So, Tom, we all know <clears throat> that wellness is under tremendous scrutiny today. And Kaiser Wellness is the signature of the conversation Kaiser has, certainly in its marketing and conversations with employers. Um, but some employers are still on the sidelines about health and wellness and the like. What is it? that keeps those employers on the sidelines? What, what is it that pre prevents them from embracing this idea that health, improving health, is somehow an important thing for their companies and their businesses? Well, it's interesting, just like what Wayne was describing, they haven't made the connection with the business impact that health is already having on their, on their organization. Um, and I can only echo a little bit of what Wayne says when people describe Wow, if I had only known. So when you hear customers kind of say the opposite about, boy, the customer service, I've heard from my customers that I must have done great training because the service has gotten so much better and all they did was put in a meaningful wellness program or that um, my people's morale was so much better at work and all they did was you know, some, just care about their people a little bit more at the work site. Um, the, the ones that are standing on the, usually on the sideline are hanging heavily on the ROI they're, not, they're uh, not realizing they're already paying for this in significant ways. Um, they don't realize that it's, um, you know, that not only is this driving their productivity today, but it's gonna limit their economic viability in the future. And it's really a business um, discussion that, that they're not sort of rationalizing, they're stuck in that cost box. And, uh, and I really think that the challenges for, for owners out there is really to, you know, describe something at work that you've done to improve your business over time, whether it's, you know, have you ever put in a quality program? Have you ever put in a safety program or something that's made a significant difference in your business model? And what did it take to do that? And, and what were some of the feelings or attitudes that had to be realized? Who had to be in the room to help you make those decisions and implement it effectively? And when you, you know, when you get customers sort of describing something they did that was kind of in a parallel, to implementing something as unique as sort of a, a wellness uh, initiative, then, you, then they start to realize that that's the kind of business uh, impact it can have, number one. And then number two, that it takes that sort of business discipline to really realize the benefits. And ROI, it's all about the investment. It's more about the return on the value you get for your investment. It's not just about if I put four bucks in, will I get six bucks back? Thank you. you know, I'd like to add to that. I, I totally agree with that. And the other thing that I've noticed, I've visited over 100 clients in the last two years. So I've really heard, I've seen a lot of across the continuum, and I've heard those a lot. The other thing I've heard is that um, what I would describe as a poorly planned, poorly thought out strategy has, in the past, has led to poor outcomes. And so the answer is, well, we tried it and it didn't work. 
And, it, and that's really a lack of strategy, lack of planning, lack of, lack of dedication. Doesn't mean it can't work, because we all know that there are places where it can work. But I think the point is, this is hard work. And um, you know, we've all been at this for a long time, but it, it's not easy to do this. And some, I think, you know, if an employer is going into it and say, I'm going to sign a mid-level benefits guy to run all of our wellness programs and everything's going to be great, uh, those are the ones that really struggle sometimes. So, Mike, let me take you back to your Caterpillar days, <clears throat> when you were medical director at Caterpillar. I just got a blood transfusion and got all the yellow blood out of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you build the case at Caterpillar for taking a population health perspective, integrating data, and using data as a way to really guide your decisions? Yeah, we, we made the promise, I think, bold, bold promise. Caterpillar was looking at, uh, when I, I started in 2000, uh, first couple of years, their health care cost inflation was about 6 to 8% per year. And a lot of us were looking at that <clears throat> and trying to figure out what we could do to help that. Uh, certainly wasn't me, it was a team. I was part of the team. But um, we sat in front of the senior executive office on one annual review and showed them the cost curve projection of what costs would be at 6% every year from 2002 to 2010 if we continued on the way we were. And it was going to exceed a billion dollars by, by 2010, which was a significant part of the profit. And then we showed them what, what CPI was doing over that same period of time. And we said, um, we have been working on this, and we believe that we have a, um, a line of sight to keeping health care inflation at or below CPI through 2010. And that's going to save X amount of dollars. And we put the detail behind it so they could see what we were thinking about it, how we were going to use the data to, to make this happen. And they said, we're all in. And we went from there. So it, was, it wasn't, you know, early on, I, I'd love to say it was about improving productivity and improving engagement and retention. It was strictly, how do we work on this cost problem? But remember, this was 2002, and that's kind of where everybody was at the time. So we used the data that we had. We didn't have any HRA data or biometric data. Really, all we had was claims information. But we went back and looked at what's modifiable, what could be changed, what could we reasonably expect to be able to alter, and how would that affect the, the, the claims cost, and put together that projection. And we actually beat that projection by 2010. So sustainability is kind of the buzzwords out there. Yet I've seen a relatively large number of employers that have had a, a health and productivity strategy, and they've had support in senior management, and the head guy leaves and all of a sudden it's starting from scratch. So Wayne, let me start with you. How do you sustain this initiative in volatile economic times and change in senior leadership? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> well, first the American Express Healthy Living Program, <clears throat> wellness program, uh, was launched in March of 2009 globally. The depths of the financial crisis in the U.S. and actually globally. So. Um, <clears throat> To sustain it, you have to continue to have innovation. And you have to have, I believe, broad, in our case, global leadership support. And we're going to be launching, or are launching Healthy Living 2.0, we're going to call it, because it will be more innovation. And in a couple of weeks, I formed a leadership team of four of our business leaders top business leader from around the world, because ours is a global program given the nature of our business. But continued innovation, and you've heard it from other speakers today, that if you continue to do what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always gotten. You ha and it's a fa our business is a fast-moving business, uh, and, and like most, if not all, your companies in this, or, uh, this room. And you have to be continuing to look for what you're going to do to uh, address the needs. Our employee base is rapidly changing. You know, we talk about call centers. <clears throat> yes, we have call centers, but the new call center for uh, many companies are employees working from home. And many of us in the room, a part of our week is working from home. That's the new call center. That's the new base, and there's lots and lots of other innovation going on around the world that we have to be able to prepare to address uh, and address the, our business needs. So Tom and Mike, how have you seen that issue play out with um, clients when there's a change in leadership or 
tough economic times, the sustainability, how do you sustain this discussion? Well, I, I think I've seen lots of times when it hasn't been sustainable. And I've thought about this a lot. And um, it seems like that we, when I was working before, and with the clients with whom I work now, um, it, this is where it gets into, you might refer to it as a succession plan for leaderships who understand what you're trying to do, which is another way of saying truly having a culture of health within the organization. And, and I think that a lot of us have been very focused on tactical issues of trying to you know, get this program up and running, making it work and making it go. And, and um, it's real easy in a day-to-day -day life, at least it is for me, to fall into those kind of traps and not get back to leadership, Wayne, to your point. Get back to leadership and also next year's leaders. And so people all the way up the chain, you know, th that's the culture. And when you get to the point where the leaders throughout the organization understand that it is to their competitive interest for their employees to be high performers, once they get there, uh, then you can continue to nourish that and develop that. But I, I think it's, it's that's, uh, to me, that's why this whole culture of health thing has, has arisen, because that's the only way to sustainability. If we're just doing tactical programs, they're not sustainable. As soon as, as, soon as your, your, your champion in your company leaves, you're back to square one, and we can't do that. So that's the culture of health. That's the point of that. Do you opinion. have some additions here? Yeah, the only thing I was going to, I was going to add, he, he, say basically what I was going to describe, but more importantly, and I've heard Dee describe this uh, eloquently, is you've got to get it down to that front level, front level staff and front level supervisors. So it's more than leadership, and where they fall apart is when you haven't been able to pull it into the culture. So having all those environmental factors and policies reflecting the culture that you're trying to set up, but also driving it down so that people own it at the lowest possible level, and, and so that when there's a change in the leader, it's, it's not a big deal. You, you still believe it in your work unit or at your desk level, and, it, and it's something you can sustain. And in addition to that, the operations leaders. You know, that middle management group, and, and that's another thing. Dee, you're teaching all of us. I don't know where you are, but, <laughs> but um, you know, that was in the zero trend. That was one of the, one of the main, you know, it's, it's leadership, it's middle management, you know, it's frontline worker. That's, and that's really developing the culture, is if, is if everybody buys into that along the way. But you're absolutely right. Everybody's got to buy into it. So I'll ask the panel one more question, then open it up to the audience before we break. <clears throat> so I talked a bit about the need to go beyond the traditional health and productivity model and engage in discussions in integrating things like corporate culture, corporate structure, risk and benefits, well-being, engagement. So what are strategies about bringing those broader issues into the what has been the traditional conversation about health and productivity. So, Wayne, let's start with you on that. Yeah, I, well, I think first, uh, you know, we, we look at the traditional health risk appraisal data, and it's important. It's a core part of it. But including uh, engagement questions, other questions, as you related to in uh, what Dee has called the next generation of health risk appraisals. The next generation is out there, uh, but we have to get beyond um, uh, the traditional questions uh, and uh, because other things predict it. Um, they, there are a number of other questions and issues about culture and so forth and other databases that potentially can be linked, not individually, but for populations. Um, and uh, again, uh, the speaker, Bob uh, Strand, mentioned that uh, the leader and the quality of the leader. And our corporation has 360 degree evaluations and annual employee satisfaction uh, surveys. That kind of data, I think, has to be better linked to. Thank you. Tom? You know, I, would, I think one of the um, things I'd like to add on with what Wayne described was the being a, we're mostly a population health management company, being both a healthcare provider and an insurance company. So we have unique uh, views into, into total populations. And this, this uh, uh, health equity and populations lagging behind has become sort of one of the things that when, you're, when you find that you've done everything you could possibly do and you have a, a, a award-winning program and you still only have 65% of your people engaged, there's something else going on. And, uh, and I think finding you know, appropriate ways and unique ways to engage those populations and what those barriers look like uh, from their point of view has been something that completely changed the way you communicate, the way you engage, and the way you offer uh, information and programs at the workplace to, to influence um, those, those populations. And 
I think that's been all the standard stuff is, you know, whether you bring in the, the comp and the disability and the lost time and all that other information, but that's one of the newest aspects, I think, that really changes the way the data is presented. Yeah, and I just comment on that. Health disparities, for example, is part of this, and uh, we published an article in JOAM last year, but health disparities in the United States and actually in other countries is very, very important uh, and really relatively uncommonly looked at right now. Thank you. And Mike, I, I think if you think about value, which was, you can easily define as quality divided by cost, and that's when the easy part goes away. But, but employers need to drive more value in the healthcare system. And, and to do that, employers, I, in my view, have an opportunity to go outside of their walls. Certainly, whatever they can do to improve the, uh, the health and productivity and performance of their workers is absolutely critical. But for large employers that have significant sphere of influence, um, there's a, there are a lot of discussions out there in communities about how to work with hospitals to improve community care, um, how to work with health plans. We're all hearing the term convergence, and, and that's a hot topic right now, and it's because what's happening is, is as we're starting to think about value and not fee for service, but think about value, it's open doors to, for a lot of, 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 of uh, partnerships and associations that would have never been possible even five years ago. And, and I see lots of examples of large employers partnering with, with hospitals and having um, you know, arrangements such that better care is being delivered, they're getting performance guarantees for, that actually mean something, and they're actually working on improving the quality of care. So I, I think as we continue this, this effort, we need to continue this effort, I think one of the next steps is, is moving outside the walls of our companies and starting to get involved with the plans and the hospitals and, and really, as this idea of convergence takes care of it, it, just remember, it's about improving the value of the services that you're paying for. And that's what we really all want at the end of the day, is higher value care for what we're giving. And right now, in 2014, um, from my view, there are more opportunities to do that now than there have been. And so I would encourage, you know, but what, every time we've got companies that have some kind of clout, get outside there, look with the communities, let's move this to the next level and really improve the value of care that we're giving. Not only for our employees, but employers have a, we're paying for more than half the healthcare costs in the country, so we have a stake in this game of, of actually improving the value and fixing this fragmented system we have now. Thank you. So, <clears throat> last couple minutes in the session, give you a chance to ask questions. Thank you, Gary, for always being the first questioner. I appreciate that. It's one of the things I've loved about you for the last 20 years. You don't um, have to state your name, Gary. <laughs> but it's an opportunity for you to ask the panel uh, questions that are on your mind. So, Gary, go ahead. Okay. Well, as a quick background, I'm sure we all remember in terms of population health that the American workforce is getting older, fatter, and sicker by the minute. Bearing that in mind, I'd like to hear your comments on the study published in JAMA last week, which looked at, this is the most comprehensive study of its kind that has been done, that looked at community-based NCQA certified management of chronic health in southeast Pennsylvania over a period of several years. And it showed conclusively, methodologically superb study that it did absolutely nothing, zero. There were no results, nothing improved. Let me take that on. I'm happy to take that on. Um, as you read that article, it's very clear that, several things are clear. One is that the early focus on that program was around certification. And physicians were paid up to $20,000 per year, up to, up to $92,000 in total to get certified with this program. Now, if you look at the methods section of the paper, the methods says what they did was they offered um, internet-based training for practices, uh, coaches who were trained in practice improvement to work with people on an ad hoc basis, um, and other things um, that was fairly minimal. There was no discussion of any structural changes within the practice. Um, the focus was childhood asthma, and adult diabetes. And, and I wrote a blog about this this morning, but in my view, that's perfectly designed to show no value. It's not a, a patient-centered medical home pilot. It was a, an attempt at an internet-based, with a little on-site work on 
case management, and they didn't even pick their diabetic case management by targets. They just went after them. Um, there was no discussion about having a CDE on site, no discussion about group, group um, uh, uh, sessions for people with diabetes, no discussion about heart failure registries. Um, I, I think that that was an interesting attempt, but to use that RAND study and the other RAND study from PepsiCo to say that patients that are medical homes have no value um, is just a, a, a blatant misstatement of, of, of the facts. And in fact, I agree with the authors, because the authors said what this study shows is that we need to have standards around patient-centered medical homes. And that clearly was not a standard. So all it proved is that you could do it wrong. Can I make a brief, a brief yeah. comment? And I, I totally agree with Mike. Now, our model uh, at American Express for employees is different with chronic diseases. We have worksite clinics in our major worksites around the world. In the United States, uh, starting two years ago, I have two nurses that uh, basically provide disease management programs, but they're integrated with our clinics, with our nurse practitioners, our doctors, our health coaches, our EAP counselors, mental health counselors, uh, dietitians that are at the work site and uh, working with employees and offering that. Uh, we have great data. We have a virtual program too, but we have great outcomes data. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a you might say a form of medical home model, totally different than the JAMA report. Totally different. Yeah, it was, it was really just it was case management of yeah. two conditions. And if you're looking for improvement in childhood asthma over a three-year period of time, what are you looking at? You're looking at adherence rate to inhalers or hospital rid ER? What do we look at? So I, mean, I think um, it's a great effort, and I applaud that they attempted to do it. I think the, today's model of a, of a PCMH is dramatically different, and it's really team-based approach. It's actually patient-centered, and you know, with CDE, the whole thing that we've been talking about. So I, I think that, to my, in my view, again, is this be taped? <laughs> by the way, Nim, I want edit function. By the way, um, but but I think there there are certainly opportunities to do PCMH programs uh, very very well. Nim, this is a question for Mike. Hello, Mike. Nice to see you again. Um, so you made the point about how our healthcare system is moving towards a value-based system. I think studies suggest that within the next five years, 50% of hospital systems are going to be um, risk-based, uh, contracting, et cetera. And it's a call to action for employers to, to work directly with hospital systems. Is Truven doing anything around analytics to help at the workbench so that providers can assess risk more effectively manage risk more effectively, and any analytics to really help hospital systems with population health, which they're struggling with at this time? Yeah, and without having a commercial of what we're doing, I'll, I'll just say that um, we've been measuring hospital performance improvement for, for years and have a, um, um, and again, I'm not trying to have a commercial here, but Tom, I'm just answering the question, okay? <laughs> but uh, it's called Hunter Tap Hospital, but it has a, a series of core measures and it's around um, like surgical complications around admission rates, around profitability, leadership traits, a whole series and ends up with a balanced scorecard that is able to see how well, what the high performing hospitals are. Um, and we went back and looked at, at correlation between high performance hospitals according to our analytics and winners of the Baldridge Award and we discovered that when a hospital system wins a Baldridge Award within three years they typically win a hundred top awards so they actually do measure process improvement. It's, 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 it's not a news week who's popular who markets well. It's actually using data to say where are the high performers and there are some that are consistently high performers and they win every year. So um, we also are developing metrics around physicians in a much the similar way. That's by the way a much harder thing to do because Quality measures around physician care is really, it's so broad and so encompassing, and physicians don't typically have enough data on any one condition to put good quality measures out there. So that's why the physician measures have lagged behind hospital measures. Well, I think we've uh, reached the end of our time and we're rapidly approaching our reception. So I want to thank uh, our panel for your great comments and contributions today.